forum. Um, so I'm Councillor Premier with Councillor Andrew Wood. So this there's a lot of interest in neighbourhood planning forums. We've had the Isle of Dogs neighbourhood plan adopted. You've got the Spitalfields neighbourhood plan going to a referendum. Um, I know uh, people in my land, for example, want to set up their own neighbourhood uh, planning forum and a neighbourhood plan, mainly focused around Burnett Road, economic regeneration and estate regeneration, which is different problems, say, from the Brick Lane area or, or Isle of Dogs. Um, so some of my questions to Andrew would be centred around those kind of issues of reviving the high street. That's the issue that we have on Burnett Road. Um, so, um, so straight. So I'm going to let Andrew um, start. I know uh, before we started recording, Andrew was posed a question. So it'd be good if Andrew, if you could repeat that question, then answer it. Okay. Yeah. Just to sort of help Saif, because I know he sort of asked this question and not to repeat stuff that he already knows. So the question was, can you update a neighborhood plan, you know, once it's sort of gone through the formal process. Um, and it's not an area I have a lot of experience of, because I think a lot of most neighborhood plans are kind of wrote their first neighborhood plan and kind of stopped. So I'm not aware of anybody who's actually done a second one or an amendment, but, but uh, I just put in a chat. Um, so yes, sir, there is a way of updating neighborhood plan, but it depends on the changes you want to make as to what the process is. So if it's a minor change, um, like correcting errors, then there's no need for a second referendum. It kind of just goes through almost like an internal process with, with Tower Hamlet's council. So for example, um, the council spotted a mistake that was made, I think for Roman Road, and it had to go back to cabinet to correct the mistake, uh, but you didn't have to go anywhere else for that. But if there are material modifications, uh, which do not change the nature of the plan or order uh, would, re would require a new public examination, which I'll talk about in more detail later, but not a second referendum. Um, but then material modifications, which do uh, you know, fundamentally change a plan or add new planning policies, then it's almost like you'd have to repeat the process again um, and have a referendum at the end of that, that process. Um, so it depends on the kind of changes that you want. But there is, I think that there is a process in place uh, for doing that. Um, because, I mean, the government have been talking about this idea that they want local plans, uh, which is what the council write, to be updated every five years. And therefore, the logic would be is that must apply to, to neighbourhood plans as, as well. Um, so that, yes, there is a process. Uh, the only sort of slight difficulty is that neighbourhood planning forums uh, have only got a five-year life and then after five years they have to kind of reapply um, and I've, I think Spitalfields no they did reapply sorry I've forgotten that yeah so Sp I think Spitalfields have renewed their life so they've got more time <coughs> the way it works is that um, it's the forum uh, that takes the lead on this so if, if Spitalfields decided or people in Spitalfields decided they wanted to do an amendment that they have to do it via the existing Spitalfields Forum because it is live and it has been recognised by the council as the legitimate body. Uh, but, but yes, they can make changes. Um, so I don't know if Saif had any questions before I kind of moved on to the um, starting from scratch. So, uh, In terms of the changes, what, uh, I mean, what, what kind of, I mean, you said there's a limited amount of changes you can make. Um, what I'm mean, sort of supplementary element doesn't really come into, is that right? Um, so this is so if you if you're going to make fundamental policy changes um, like changing the nature of the plan, then, then you would need to go to have a second referendum, and you'd have to evidence uh, the fun, you know the, the basis for those changes. And so, in part, of the problem with neighbor so that there's two things that neighbourhood planning can can really do in terms of of the the legal weight. I mean, neighbourhood planning can do lots of things, but in terms of what the legal deliverables are, one of which is to write a neighbourhood plan, uh, and the second of which is to make recommendations to the council as to how community infrastructure levy or SIL should be spent. There is a kind of third category, um, which, uh, I mean, I call it recommendations. So the, the problem that the Isle of Dogs had is there were things that we wanted to do on the Isle of Dogs, and then the, both the council... And the examiner sort of said, well, you, you could, they're not land use policies. So a good example was, is that we had lots of detail about how we thought 
estate regeneration should go. And there is a policy in the neighborhood plan about estate regenerations, but it's not the first policy that we wrote because the, basically the examiners have said um, these are not land use policies. We disagreed with him. Uh, we thought they were land use, uh, but because we didn't have the money to challenge him in, in a high court, uh, and because nobody else, you know, the council weren't going to back us up, the GLA weren't going to back us up on this, is that, you know, we basically accepted that we couldn't put everything we wanted through as a neighbourhood plan. So our, our neighbourhood plan currently has some recommendations at the end of it. They don't carry, and there's, a, there's an argument with Tower Hamlets Council. So our argument initially is they carry some weight because they've gone through a formal process, they've been uh, consulted on, and people have voted on it, whereas Tower Hamlets Council take the view uh, that there's zero weight, they can have no impact on the planning process whatsoever. So there was there's a kind of internal argument between planning officers and us as to what, if any, weight these things should should bear and you know uh, should have uh, on the planning system as a whole. And there may well be a planning application that comes forward. So let's say in the state regeneration that comes forward that ignores everything that we're trying to do. And I think at that point, we would then quote, well, you know, people did vote for this. Yes, it may not have the same weight and law as the, the, the neighborhood plan policies, but it, it's still better than you or I sort of saying, you know, to the housing association, you should do this because we should, you know, what you can do is to say, you should do this because it's gone through a formal process and a referendum vote at the end of it. Um, and that's how we try to deal with some of those conflicts between what's land use and what is and, and the problem that we had uh, on the Isle of Dogs is our examiner. I think we were a bit unlucky is that he did not like pushing the boundaries of what was land use at all. Um, there are other neighborhood plans who I think have either been luckier or maybe just had the right examiner who did push the boundaries of what of what land use is. But I think in our cases that we, yeah, we got stuck with this examiner, partially our fault because we were involved in, in picking him as well, um, who just didn't like pushing the boundaries at all, even if we had all of the evidence to support that. Um, so that, that was kind of like the sort of the, the background to us. So, so yes, you, you can do things, but again, it'll depend on what it is you're trying to do and whether or not you can justify it as a land use policy or not. That's really useful. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so if I, uh, so unless you've got more questions, if I kind of go back to the beginning for Rukun's benefit and for others who might be watching it, so if I kind of just go back to the beginning and to kind of explain what this is uh, all about, and I just see somebody else is just joining us, so I'll wait until they're connected. Connect. So it says connecting on audio. So just give me a um, a few seconds. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then, yeah, by the time I sort of do my introduction, yeah, yeah, okay, they're on, online. So, so just kind of some background to, to neighbourhood planning, starting from first principles. So this all started uh, with the coalition government uh, in 2011. Um, there was something called a Localism Act, and the coalition government were, were quite keen on involving people in the pr planning process more than had happened in the past. And you know, this has been a you know, wider issue. I mean, the Labour government before 2010 also made some changes uh, to do with local councils, which we might talk about later on. And it's all part of this trying to bring ordinary people uh, more into the planning system or to give ordinary people kind of more power within the planning system. Because the planning system historically has basically been, well, it's the local council, it's the mayor of London, it's the government, and its developers, um, they're the people who have a role to play, uh, councillors to some extent, but residents, you know, you can complain, but you, you have no formal role uh, in the process unless you go to a planning committee and you know, for three minutes you can tell the planning committee why they should reject a planning application. So the whole point of this was, was to give you as local residents more formal powers within the planning system through something called neighborhood planning. It's not complete power, um, so you can't override everything that's happened in the past, but it's more power than what you've had in the past because what you've now got is the ability to write planning policies, which if they go through the full process, which I'll describe quickly, 
those planning policies carry the same weight and law as Tower Hamlets Council's own local plan. So they're, they're, you know, and getting Tower Hamlets Council planning officers to recognise this is a bit of a struggle, which is something that we're doing on the Isle of Dogs. But but no, legally, uh, they carry the same weight and, and law. Um, they just go through a slightly different process. Um, and the process is basically is that if you want to write some planning policies for your area or make formal recommendations on how to spend 25% of the community infrastructure levy, which is the money paid by developers to the council for, for new infrastructure, is you have to do one of two things. Either you form a local council for the area, which is a whole separate process, which I'm going to skip for now, or, which is what's already happened in Tower Hamlets Council area a number of times, is you form a neighbourhood planning forum. And the neighbourhood planning forum is basically, it's a group of residents. I think you need a minimum of 21 residents where you kind of formally to come together and you agree several things. So the one thing that you agree on is that you want to do this, that you want to form a neighbourhood planning forum. The second thing you need to agree is what is the area that you want to have some influence and control over? Um, and there are some guides as to how you come up with, with that area, which I, I'll talk in a bit more detail later about how that worked for us in the Isle of Dogs. You need to adopt a constitution, but there are copies already that you just have to adapt. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about Spitalfields Neighbourhood Planning Forum and also Isle of Dogs Neighbourhood Planning Forum. And a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are on the websites of both organisations and I put in the chat earlier links to their websites and also to the to the government guidance. And I'll I might repost that later because I know if you've just joined Zoom, I'm not sure if you can see what I posted uh, ten minutes ago. So once you've got a constitution, you've got a group of people who have agreed to form this neighbourhood planning forum, and you've got a name. Uh, you then apply to Tower Hamlets Council to be recognised as the official neighbourhood planning forum for that area. And you can't override an existing forum. So you couldn't come onto the Isle of Dogs. Well, actually, no, you could. Try right, a slight difficulty because we're, we're not recognised anymore. But let's say Spitalfields, for example. You couldn't come to Spitalfields and say, we want to set up a new forum because already there's a forum that already exists. Um, but there are a number of areas across Tower Hamlets where there are no, no neighbourhood planning forums. But where they kind of do exist is Spitalfields, who's got the referendum on the 11th of November. You've got Poplar Ward, where Sister Christine is working on one. Uh, Isle of Dogs. And the reason why I sort of hesitated a second ago is because um, neighbourhood planning forums have a five-year lifespan and, and our five years elapsed in April. So the Isle of Dogs Neighbourhood Planning Forum is still trying to think about what, what we do next. And there's been a few delays. But in theory, there is a neighbourhood planning forum for the Isle of Dogs. There was one for Limehouse, but they ran into some problems. And there's one for Roman Road as well, uh, which is recognised. So you go to the council with basically two things, which is one is the neighbor planning forum. And the second thing is the area. And just you're aware is the council can change the area if they don't like it. Uh, they didn't like the area on the Isle of Dogs. So one of the things that happened to us is that um, our area, they, they um, yeah, the mayor removed a third of our area because uh, he just basically did, didn't thought our area was, was too big. Um, but yeah. That's yeah, it's one of the battles that we've had. So this, so just you're aware, this is not an easy process. There, there will be battles involved in this. One of the good things, though, for, for people coming after us is a lot of those battles have been resolved. And also the government changed a lot of the rules. So, for example, for the Isle of Dogs, as we had lots of, of really long delays in our process, and some of them are fault, some of them the GLA's fault, some of them the council's fault, but the government introduced some rules. So for example, they have to make decisions within I think 13 or 16 weeks. That didn't apply when we started. So we had some big delays because the council just took a long time to make decisions and they can't, they can't do that anymore because the government have put these timetables in. And then hopefully what happens is the council ends of say, fine, we recognize you as the planning forum for uh, this area. And then what you then do is you write a neighborhood plan uh, and you will get help from government as well. So if you apply to government is they will give you some consultancy support. So some free consultancy report. And I think you can, I think it's 18,000 pounds. Now uh, you apply from a grant from government and your neighborhood planning forum will be paid 18,000. I think it's 17 or 18,000 pounds by the government to help pay for the costs of this. 
Um, and there are different ways of doing this. We, we took the decision to do this all ourselves. So we spent that money on kind of legal expertise and printing costs um, and kind of various support packages and the website. Whereas other people, I think Limehouse were going down the route is that they'd pay a consultancy 12,000 pounds to kind of do this work for them. Um, and at the end of this process, you, you write a neighborhood plan. And the key elements of this neighborhood plan are um, some policies. Um, and these are the policies that have the same weight and law as I said, the council's local plan. And, but the important point about it is, is at this stage is you've needed to prove several things. One of which is that you have engaged with the wider community, that you have talked to people, that you've gone out and, you know, and there's just not this little secret group of, you know, three of you in a room doing this all by yourself. You need to prove, you know, via social media or leaflets or newspaper articles or whatever it is, that you have done your best um, to communicate to the people in your area as widely as possible. And that when you write your policies, that there is a, you know, evidence behind why you need that policy. So for example, air quality, I mean, that's a relatively easy one. There's lots of evidence for air quality. Uh, we wrote some policies on construction management because basically developers don't manage construction very well, but we had lots of evidence of that in terms of pictures and written evidence and all the rest of it. Um, and you end up with this formal document, which is a neighborhood plan with all of the evidence behind it. Uh, you then have a six week public consultation where you then have to, to consult statutory bodies. So for, for example, for us, Thames Water, um, you know, Southwark Council across the water from us. Um, so we basically had to prove that we consulted all of those people, that they fed into us. And at the end of that, we made some rewrites. We then gave the neighborhood plan to the council who then did a, another six week public consultation. Uh, and these are all laid out. Uh, so there's an act of parliament. So everything I'm talking about is set out by government. There's an act of parliament that sets out the rules and how this all works. Um, once you do that, the council then gather all the responses. It then goes to an independent examiner who then reads the neighborhood plan. And, and basically their role is just to sort of say whether things are legal or, or not legal. Uh, so they think you're doing something illegal, they'll cross it out, but they'll probably just suggest some amendments. And then the very last stage of all of this is, is a referendum. And in the case of Spitalfields, Oddly, because it's a business area and residents, they've actually got two referendums. One is for businesses and one is for residents. Whereas for the Isle of Dogs, it was residents only. And then for the Isle of Dogs referendum, we had ours in May after delays because of COVID. Uh, and we had 86% support. Um, so across London, I think there's been about 18 of these referendums so far. And the average yes vote is about 88, 89%. Um, some higher, some lower. So, you know, it shows that there is a lot of support for doing this. Um, and now what we've got for the Isle of Dogs is an approved neighbourhood plan. So any future development, so when a developer submits a planning application in future, another point I should have said, um, when the examiner finalises their report, it's from that date onwards that actually the neighbourhood plan has a lot of weight in the, in the, in the planning system because I think out of the three or 400 referendums in the United Kingdom, uh, 297 have been yes votes and only three have been no votes. So by the time the examiner says your plan is OK, uh, it's pretty much automatic, pretty much that you'll get a yes vote uh, from residents, unless you've done a really bad job and come up with policies that local residents really hate, in which case they're going to vote no. But the whole point of neighbourhood planning is that you're doing this with your community so why would your community vote no if you've done a good job on consulting them on the neighbourhood plan? Um, so now the, the Isle of Dogs neighbourhood plan, so any planning application that comes forward uh, has to prove, uh, and this is a battle for the Isle of Dogs, by the way, when I talked about battles earlier, this is the battle that we're now at, is that you know, they have to evidence that they are compliant with a neighbourhood plan. And if they're not compliant, if they're doing things contrary to what's in the neighbourhood plan, that's then grounds for rejecting the planning application because the whole point of a planning system in theory, at least, um, is you have planning policies and planning officers have to weigh them up and then the decision, you know, so there's a big out planning application, the councils and the planning committee have to weigh it up. And if the planning policies sort of say no, then they should reject the planning application. 
Uh, we operate in an environment in Tower Hamlets, which is very pro-development. Um, so that can be a difficult battle. But the thing about a neighborhood plan is that, you know, as I said, it carries legal weight. It's gone through a formal process. So if you go, you know, and object to Brick Lane or, or let's say another planning application to so say, I don't like it. Yes, council can reject that. But if you go and so say, I don't like it. And by the way, it contradicts planning policy DR3 and planning policy XB10. That carries a lot more weight because also, and there is evidence of this, you know, people, even like government ministers have rejected planning applications. And the reason that they then say the, re the reason why they rejected that planning application is because it contradicted the local neighborhood plan. So uh, this is why it gives you a lot more weight uh, than just you as an individual, even you as a group saying you don't like something because you can say you don't like it because it contradicts something that's gone through a very formal and legal process backed up by uh, acts of parliament and backed up now by common law because there are lots of examples of when they where planning applications have been rejected in part or wholly because of what was in the, in the neighborhood plan so that in a nutshell very quickly uh, is what neighborhood planning is 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 all about and, and the other th power that uh, it's got is the ability to make some recommendations to tower hamlets council where the 25 percent of community infrastructure levy should be spent so, for example, on the Isle of Dogs, uh, ASDA got planning permission. Uh, if it gets built, it will pay Tower Hamlets Council £43 million in community infrastructure levy, 25% of that, so just over uh, £10 million, uh, is where the Isle of Dogs Neighbour Planning Plan has a role to play in terms of recommending where that money should be spent. Um, and then we were talking at the very beginning, I know some of you just joined after this about this idea of recommendations. So inevitably there'll be things a community will ask for, which you can't write as a planning policy because they're not land use policies. Um, and there are some things which are on a dividing line and, and we in the Nile Dogs, we tried to push that dividing line and weren't allowed to, but it may be that, you know, other people may want to try and put things just over the boundary and, and you may be luckier to do that. But what we did in our neighborhood plan is we made some recommendations, for example, on estate regeneration about how the voting should work for that, because people have done a lot of work. Um, and recommendations, according to Tower Hamlets Council, bear no weight whatsoever in the planning process, whereas our argument was recommendations have gone through a formal process of consultation, they've gone to a referendum, they're in that neighborhood plan, and they carry some weight, even if it's only a public relations weight. So... So, you know, it's still worthwhile, you know, having some of these recommendations in because, you know, they may be useful one, one day. Because, um, again, it, it has more weight than if just you or I to say, well, you should do this. We can say, well, you should do this because actually it's a recommendation in the neighbourhood plan. Um, and that makes it just a little bit harder for people to ignore it. OK, so I'm going to um, stop at that point because I've been talking for a bit of time. Um, so in, in the chat, as I said, I've put links to, to three websites, one of which is Spitalfields Neighbourhood Planning Forum, Isle of Dogs, uh, who've you know, gone through this whole process and also then to the government um, website about neighbourhood planning, which is quite a good summary from government as, as to how it all works and what the rules are. And then it has links to the evidence just to prove uh, some of the things that I'm saying. So okay. I'd, I'd like questions? to come in with a question, um, Andrew. So you've talked about how neighborhood planning forms and neighborhood plans can stop things happening. Mm -hmm. What about enabling things, other things to happen? So I, I just want to give two issues we have, which I picked up as a council in my land, is we have a very long high street, which is Burdett Road, yeah. um, which has quite a lot of independent businesses. Um, it has been going, there's been a slow decline in that shopping parade. Mm -hmm. uh, it has as many businesses as Brick Lane, uh, just counting them up. Um, so we want to revive that shopping precinct. It used to, there used to be a market there, mm -hmm. the market. So the retailers thinking about can we get the market back to increase footfall, etc. In the area is strategically located, east, west, north, south. It's, it's a transport junction, so a specialised market on a Sunday it might work there. Um, the other aspect we have is there have been huge, there's massive estate regenerations 
uh, happening. Um, so we've got six massive uh, social housing estates. Um, a lot of them are due for estate regeneration. One of them uh, is happy. They're putting two foot on top. So like these um, prefab units. Mm -hmm. So what, what that is, is, is putting a lot of pressure on existing infrastructure. Uh, for example, community centers, um, et cetera, or public places to meet. Um, the more people you have, um, you, need, you need public spaces and there's a massive pressure on public spaces, uh, et cetera. And, and the park is there, but at nighttime, it's not actually a safe place, so to speak, due to various factors. Um, so, so, so those are the two issues so a lot of so what can say a neighborhood plan uh plan can do to enable say a revival of the retail space with a market uh, and additional so like civic spaces in the area again to increase footfall okay so i'll talk about the burdett road one first so what you can't do in a neighborhood plan is sort of say is there will be a market on Sunday between nine o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon, because that's not planning related directly. Um, there's a different sort of um, sphere of activity. But what you can do in a neighborhood plan is that you can sort of evidence the fact that there's been a decline in business. A lot of neighborhood planning forums across the country, especially outside of London, are very much focused on their high street. So you'll find, well, actually, there's one in Ealing. So, for example, the Ealing neighborhood plan was very much focused about restoring Ealing as a kind of central shopping um, centre. Uh, and that was a business and resident sort of led one as well. I haven't read it in a long time, so I can't remember exactly what their policies were. But the whole point of that neighbourhood plan was about rejuvenating Ealing sort of town centre as a whole, because again, it was suffering from some of the, the same problems. So what you can kind of put in the neighbourhood plan will be things, you know, evidencing the problems and so sort of saying, you know, any future planning applications that come forward in the area need to support the recreation of the market and need to support businesses. So if a planning application comes forward that makes it even more difficult to restore the market, then that would be grounds for, for dismissal. But in a more positive sense, one of the things that you could kind of put in there would be, you know, like a map that sort of says the market is going to go here. And, you know, talking about the sill recommendations as we want more lighting uh, and we basically want the sill spent to create a marketplace. So what you can't do is sort of force the licensing for a council, but what you can do is create the physical place in the neighborhood plan for where the market should go and all of the things that you need to support a market in terms of a little map that sort of says, you know, this is where the bins, the street bin should go and the lights should go and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the servicing requirements of where the vehicle should come and park. So all of the kind of so land use is about the use of land. So anything to do with how you use land for the market, you can definitely put into a neighborhood plan and you then put the recommendation in it. So it says to the council, you know, please support us in doing this plan. But again, you know, what the neighborhood planning forum can do is, is bring the community together and the businesses that say, we want this. And it may be that actually some of the ways of doing this aren't through a written neighborhood plan, but, you know, as an official body, being able to go back to the council to say, can you support us with this neighborhood plan? Because, you know, you've got your own powers, your own talk. You've got, there's a streets market team at the council. Can we work with you to do this stuff? So it may be that you could do a lot of things without even writing a, a neighborhood plan itself. But yeah, I mean, there'll be lots of examples and other neighborhood plans of people wanting to protect their high streets and, and to encourage more businesses. And, and I think that's the other point about neighbor planning is that they're all different I mean, there may be some common themes, you know, like the villages in Yorkshire probably have some common themes about their neighbourhood plans. But the Spitalfields neighbourhood plan has very different policies from the Isle of Dogs one. And they're probably very different from the Ealing one. But you will find examples of other policies elsewhere, which, you know, may be useful. So, for example, the air quality policy and the Isle of Dogs neighbourhood plan was basically a copy of the, was it the Westminster neighbourhood plan? Because basically it's the same issue. In terms of estate regeneration, I put in the links just now, a link to uh, the Greater Carpenters um, neighbor plan. So the Carpenters estate is not far from us. It's in Newham. It's an estate just to the south of the Olympic Park. And it was a housing estate that's very worried about estate regeneration. And they've had long historic battles with 
the previous mayor of Newham and I think even the current mayor of Newham, and I don't know the full detail, but they have actually written an estate-based neighbourhood plan. Um, and from memory, there's actually a map of how they want the estate to, to be transformed. So there's a map of what the estate looks like today and then a map of, of where they want the improvements to happen in the future. And because they didn't want like everything knocked down, they, they were much more in favour, I think, of the idea of like infill and just sort of some additions rather than complete demolition. So their map is very much about keeping some of the blocks, but adding some stuff on the side to help pay for it. And then where the new community centre would, would go. So that would be a really good neighbourhood plan to look at in terms of how they, and I know there was, I think some professors, I think they had a lot of help from University College London, uh, Bartlett School of Planning. So they were different from us in the sense that they, they had some really professional support in their neighbourhood plan, at least at the beginning, I think, from memory. So that would be a good one to look at. There'll be things in the Isle of Dogs neighbourhood plan which will be useful. So there's a policy in ours about trying to encourage ballots. Um, and I know the Mayor of London is already encouraging ballots and our policy kind of re reinforces that. Uh, so before there's any kind of, you know, and for, for on the Isle of Dogs, our big housing association, one housing group, in the end, they, they agreed that they would only hold ballots in the future. But there was a period of time when they weren't promising that, which is why we did lots of work on the state regeneration ballots. So again, you could copy the policy from the Isle of Dogs plan, um, as well as look at the Carpenters one as four ideas. Um, and I think in particular, my recommendation in that would be is, is actually you come up with some maps that you co-create with people in your states as to what they would like to see in the improvements and, and which buildings they want to preserve and which one, you know, because, you know, there are buildings on the Isle of Dogs where residents of those old buildings want them knocked down. They want them to knock down 10 years ago. And they're actually frustrated that those buildings haven't been knocked down. But then there are other buildings where people really don't want them knocked down. And so, again, you know, this is where you can have conversations with local people and, and put stuff in your neighbourhood plan based on what local people want. That's the whole point. The whole point of neighbourhood plans is it's meant to be local people writing this stuff. That's cool. And and how have you, how how's the sill money? Um, because obviously you're quite advanced, you've got your plan now. Um, how does that work? So a lot of people have asked me about the 25%. Mm -hmm. um, how's that uh um spent um have you come across that because you're quite advanced on the isle of dogs just yeah if you could just uh, so, so typically what other neighborhood planning forums have done and there's, and there's probably better examples in the isle of dogs which I'll, I'll i'll explain why in a second so what you see in their neighborhood plan is you know um a chapter that basically says our still recommendations and typically what they do is they will make recommendations on projects that they want the money spent on. So typically it would be some street planters there you know, or a street light here would be at a minor level or it could be they want an improved junction here. So what they will typically do is they'll, they'll put like priorities in. So let's say this is like priority one, two or three. Um, so as SIL arrives, um, basically this is where we want to prioritize the SIL. I mean, I've seen some ones where they actually have, you know, pictures of what they want. Um, and again, in the legislation and also in, in the guidance I've just provided a link to, so also in the guidance to neighbourhood plans, there's actually a very good picture that I did a screenshot of recently that sort of says, actually I read it out on Friday, didn't I? Um, that basically sort of says what the role of a neighbourhood planning forum is uh, in terms of making recommendations. But just so you're aware, the final decision is still with Tower Hamlets Council. So you can put in your neighbourhood plan recommendations Um they have to, you know, listen to those. They can choose to ignore them if they want. There's nothing in law that, that sort of says what you've put in your neighbourhood plan must be adopted by the council. But again, you know, if you've gone through a formal process with local residents and local residents said this is where you want the money spent and you can evidence all of this engagement, it's harder for the councillors to say, it, you know, we're going to ignore what you say. Um, for the Isle of Dogs, we ran into some difficulties because we made some recommendations that basically there was a GLA document called the Development Infrastructure Funding Study where the GLA said where all the money should be spent. And we sort of said, spend the money on that document. Uh, the problem that we had is, is both the GLA and the council have decided they don't like that document anymore and are trying hard to ignore it. Um, so we're kind of stuck uh, on the Isle of Dogs. 
but yeah, my recommendation would be if you know if you put in sort of detail about where you want the money spent and what the improvement should be, um, you know, potentially it's a lot of money. Um, I'm, I'm not that aware of you know other parts, but you know, like a, I'll give you an example. So on the Isle of Dogs. Um, um, Berkeley Homes want to add five stories to a block with 45 homes in it. And that will pay Tower Hamlets Council one million pounds of extra sill just from adding five extra stories to this one building. It's in part because the sill rates in the other dogs are higher than other areas. So if you added five stories a mile end, you wouldn't get as much money. But 25% of a million pounds is 250,000 pounds. You know, it's a lot of money. Um, and, you know, so any, any sort of the bigger the development, uh, the more money that's generated, the bigger this 25 percent is. Um, and, and there are some rules about where that 25 percent sh should be spent. And one of them is basically should be spent on infrastructure. But there's also another part of the rule for the 25 percent where it sort of says um, it should be spent. It should be spent in, in ways that support the development of an area and includes affordable housing. So on the other dogs, we could actually recommend to spend some money on affordable housing if we thought it supported development of the area. So our argument might well be, you know, too many of our NHS staff or too many of our teachers or too many of our police officers are having to commute in from outside of Tower Hamlets. Let's build some affordable housing for key workers that supports the development of the area. That would be the, the argument that, that we would make. And, and the boundaries are, you know, can be quite hazy. So for example, one of the things we want to spend money on is these big belly solar powered waste compactor bins which you may have seen around the, like the Royal London Hospital or in Victoria Park. So if you have a problem with bins being full, you could say, well, put one of these, these big bins in because they kind of compact the rubbish. And then they send a text message to the council just to say, you know, I'm full, empty me. You know, those are the kind of things that you could easily spend some, some sill on. Um, so those are just some examples. So, so I'm just going to bring a statement Say if you're more interested in heritage, preservation of heritage, etc. Have you got any specific questions in regards to that, um, and how you can also put one is stopping things from happening, the other one is enabling things to happen. Have we have we got questions around that? Say, yeah, I mean, there's thanks, Andrew. There's quite a few things really interesting stuff that comes up um, for me, and I've got a few questions here. But yeah, the on the heritage issue, I mean, I I mainly navigate as a creative and a local to East London, um, particular areas where there's a South, British South Asian heritage or um, Afro-Caribbean or a mixture, which obviously London is very used to that hyper, um, hyper diversity or super diversity, I think. And often, often in some circles that's really pushed and spoken about in very glowing ways, in other ones, not so much. Um, but in planning, a lot of these communities um, who in some areas like East London areas where there's ethnic majorities, there's um, people are feeling increasingly that their culture or cultural heritage um, is being eroded, partly because the planning system, I think, or I've found is, is pretty inflexible at certain places, yeah. probably why actually these, these neighbourhood um, plans are really needed. Um, but I mean, what's been your experience with engagement with these communities uh, and also the, you know, looking at heritage outside of a kind of pre-war Victorian um, framework, which says that, you know, older buildings of that period are somehow more superior than, um, than the post-war ones. Um, and also, I mean, maybe as, as a kind of a <laughs> additional to that question is, is um, when it comes to the tall towers policy, um, what's your personal view uh, of its impact on these historic cores of some of these areas? Okay, uh, so several questions there. So if, first of all, I, I forgot to say two things quite important. So thank you for asking the question. So the first thing is two other things that you can put into a neighborhood plan. And we didn't do that on the other dogs for a whole bunch of reasons, but, but that might be in our second neighborhood plan. So in a neighborhood plan, you can designate or allocate your own heritage assets so, for example, um, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always surprised but when I look at an older building or a building that I think is important, when I actually look at the protection for that building, quite often, actually, there is no protection in the planning system for that building. 
So whether that's, you know, a pub, which is 120 years old, or we've got a pumping station, the Isle of Dogs, which was built in 1926, you know, there is no protection whatsoever for those buildings. They could be like a modern shack, you know, um, and, and also I think in terms of um, Heritage England, uh, we tried to list the pumping station and they're just resistant and the council are resistant, which I don't understand why, because also the, the council can also add these in heritage assets to their own, I think it's called the local list. And they seem resistant to doing that as well. An example of the pumping station. But what you can do in a neighborhood plan is you can say that building or that site, it's important to, to us, to our community. You have to provide some evidence. You can't just have say, we, you know, we want to protect it. You have to sort of say why it's important and, and why you want it to be protected. But you can definitely do that in the neighborhood plan. You can also do that with green assets as well. So, for example, you know, there's um, on the other dogs, there's a bit of transport for London owned land, which is just kind of wild and overgrown. One day I know they'll want to build in it uh, and we're not keen on that. So our next neighborhood plan might just say that bit of greenery um, it has no protection. It's not a park. So there's this thing that there was this place in the Limehouse Triangle where it used to be the state guard, uh, maybe bats in it. And the council just, you know, in a, well, they, 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 they sort of uh, cut down all the trees one weekend without telling anybody. They just came in and cut down all of the trees and, and they were very mature trees. And they're now building on it. And, and the argument was they could do it because that green space had no protection whatsoever. And, you know, even though people thought it was a park, it, it wasn't in planning policy. So again, you can designate your own green um, assets. So to answer the second part of your question in terms of communities, you know, the whole point of neighbor planning is that you have to prove that you have engaged with the community. And also uh, that the neighbor planning forum is reflective of that community. So for example, I said at the very beginning, when we applied, we actually applied first back in 2014, we, we had to provide um, a list to the council of all of the people who supported the neighborhood plan. And we had to prove that that, that group of people were kind of uh, mixed in terms of, I don't think we had to do ages, but I think we, we, did, we sort of demonstrated they were old and young, uh, male, female, that geographically, because ours was quite a big area, that they were geographically spread as well, that, that would be less of an issue in a small area that they were ethnically mixed as well. So we had a you know, very, and we sort of did this of analysis, which you can find on the council website, you know, so on the Isle of Dogs, I think, I think 18% of the population were of Bangladeshi origin. So we had to prove that in that initial list of names, um, that I can't remember what the, the, you know, this is many years ago, that approximately our, our membership was reflective of, of that, uh, of the wider community. What you have to be able to prove is that you have engaged, you have tried to engage with the wider community. It doesn't mean that every single person in the Isle of Dogs has to come to your meetings um, or that everybody engages because reality is, you know, lots of people lead very busy lives and just won't or just won't engage at all. And I know this is a problem. And I know this is a problem that we had in the Isle of Dogs as well is that at various points in time, you know, and that the membership of the committee has changed. I think, you know, there were points in time where our committee was too middle class, too white, uh, too male. Um, it's been better at times because like we've had people kind of join. I think the committee now is still a little bit too male, it's still a little bit too white. But again, the Isle of Dogs demographics are different from the rest of Tower Hamlets. But, you know, we have a, a decent mix as well. But you have to evidence that you have to prove that your neighbor planning forum is reflective of the wider area and of, and of your community. Because again, you, you pick the local area that you want to cover. And this is one of the difficulties that we had is because, because the council chopped off our area, uh, actually it was very difficult for us to pull some of this demographic data together because they kind of cut across lots of natural boundaries. So try if possible to pick natural boundaries or existing boundaries, because that'll make the job much easier of collating some of this evidence than where, as I said, Tower Hamlets Council just sort of chopped across lots of, of, you know, demographic boundaries and made our life actually quite difficult. But yeah, this, but you have to, you know, as I said, you have to evidence to prove because the, the examiner will want to see this evidence, will want to see evidence that you have engaged with the community. And, and I talked earlier about some neighbor planning forums got rejected. Um, and one of them is basically where this small group of people just wrote a neighborhood plan and didn't engage with people. So all of the people then sort of said, nobody engaged with us. And then the examiners have said, well, look, you're not compliant. So in the end, that's why that neighborhood plan failed is because they didn't engage with the wider community. Or there was no evidence that they tried to engage with the wider community. 
In terms of your last question about tall buildings, uh, obviously the Isle of Dogs is the place of tall buildings. Um, I think they have a role to play. You know, some people do like living in tall buildings. You know, they can generate lots of homes, you know, so like Landmark Pinnacle, you know, site of a former pub and its car park, 984 apartments and 75 stories. And some people like that. But my concerns about tall towers is kind of obviously the impact on, you know, sunlight, daylight on, on other areas. But you've got you know, this immense concentration of people in a very small area and kind of all the social infrastructure you need to support that. So the big issue on the Isle of Dogs is, is a lack of supporting infrastructure for these really tall, really dense towers. Um, so our main policy is about trying to encourage provision of social infrastructure, you know, community centres, playgrounds, or sports facilities, schools, uh, GP surgeries, all of that kind of range of stuff. Because, um, you know, in our experience, Tower Hamlets Council is, is only really interested in maybe schools and GP surgeries, but playgrounds, community centres, youth centres, um, not very interested. Um, and that's what the neighbourhood plan and the other dogs was trying to, to reverse. Uh, but we could talk, I mean, there's also, if you're aware, there's also a tall building supplementary planning document going through the planning system right now, which separately we're kind of doing lots of work on. And, and actually, that's a good reminder, the Neighbourhood Planning Forum and the other dogs has to do a response to that. But we've been so busy, we haven't had time to do that yet. So did, did I answer all of your questions or, or not? Yes, you did very well. Thank you. Um, on the tall, I mean, obviously, I mean, Kenai was quite a um, built up period with tall buildings. I mean, in terms of the... Um, the historic viewpoints, because obviously in central London, you've got the, um, um, I suppose the, the, there's particular views that are protected. Um, are those, I mean, how did those apply to people in Tower Hamlets and in, especially with regards to your plan? Um, so one, of, so in the London plan and in the Tower Hamlets council local plan, there are already a number of, of protected views. So for example, um, from, from Greenwich, from the top of the hill in Greenwich, there are some protected views of different parts of, of London. Um, so that protection already exists to some extent in the London plan and then there's also in the local plan. So one of the big arguments about West Ferry Printworks planning application on the Isle of Dogs is about the impact on the views from Greenwich and different people having different views as to the impact of, of that. And there was a famous example a few years ago where there was a planning application and there's a protected view from Richmond in West, like the Richmond Hill in West London, where you should be able to see, I think the Tower of London or I can't remember which building, it, I think it was Tower of London. And then in Newham, somebody built a building which then sort of distorts that view, but then they, they realised actually the, the view actually ended, I think, in Tower Hamlets or something. And this is one, one of the things that in the Isle of Dogs were very supportive of 3D planning using 3D models because it's much easier to kind of check issues like views in the 3D model than it is in, in the real world. Um, but I think in a neighborhood plan, I think you can, all, we, we chose not to do this because there were so many other things we wanted to do. But I think in the neighborhood plan, you can also, again, designate your own local views and so say that we want to protect this view and this vista. Um, so again, I think, you know, that's something you could put into a neighborhood plan as well. But what you couldn't do this is general rule is you can't contradict what's already in the London plan and local plan. What you can do is add your extra protected views, um, I believe, as long as you can evidence the reasons why and that, you know, they're, they're good reasons. Um, one, one thing that came up, because you mentioned um, sunlight and daylight access, um, obviously a big issue for, as there's something like 300 tower blocks coming up in London. Yeah. At the moment, um, what what sort of um, you know protection or information are you giving out to residents who might be impacted by that, especially in, in, especially the access to light? I guess um, in light of COVID and vitamin D and all the rest of it. I mean, how important is that on the list for the council? Um, so, I mean, there's already. I mean, so this is one of the big planning battles in a lot of planning applications as sunlight daylight so for asda scheme i was talking about earlier it was it was one of the big discussion points and already our planning policies the, the problem that i have with the existing planning policies is the language used in the reports is very abstract so it's not you know it's like minor so the so the, the view from your window the impact on your view of this new building is minor adverse you know what does that mean 
And, and the way it's presented in a lot of these reports is like, it's very, very detailed. And, and it's basically these words of like, you know, 89% or it's a 4% loss on, you know, on a March afternoon or else it, the impact is minor adverse. So I think it's very hard for decision makers to understand what does major adverse actually mean uh, for people. So what a neighborhood plan can't do is you can't contradict. So there is already planning policy about this. But one of the reasons why we were so keen on this idea of 3D models is what you can now do is you can go to a planning committee. So if somebody sort of says, but what does minor adverse mean? You can fly, you can go in this, in this model, this online model, you can go to the bedroom or window where this is impact and you can run a kind of like 24 hour view of what, what happens to the sun with and without this new building. So you can see very visually what the impact is of sunlight daylight of this new building on the local area, because I think this has always been the struggle is that, you know, people say it's a big impact, but, but trying to sort of demonstrate for, for people that is really difficult, which is why for us, the solution was in part 3D models to visualize what the impact is rather than these. And again, this is, you know, the reason why the council allow this to happen and developers do this is that if you look at the sunlight daylight reports, they're not easy to read. You know, if you're an accountant like me, they're a bit easier because they're basically like just like these long Excel spreadsheets of like number 34 Darfield road, um, you know, minor adverse, 20 uh, VSC 29%, you know, what does that mean? Well, VSC is vertical sky component, but you know, if you don't know how this stuff works, it's really difficult to understand, which is why we like the 3D model because then you can actually see what it, what it means. Great, thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, so in terms of neighbor planning, so you can't contradict ex an existing planning policy because they've come first. So it's based on this principle of who comes first and part, or you can't contradict strategic planning policies, but that doesn't mean you can't add detail. And I think in particular, if, especially if you've got a smaller area, and if we do an Isle of Dogs neighborhood, we're gonna do much more map-based stuff. So we're gonna do much more stuff based on maps. So for example, one of the big problems that we've had locally is when you put up a new building, is your mobile phone reception starts to be impacted because you've got a mobile phone mast here, in the building blocking the signal here. So one of the things that we're gonna do is, and we, we did do lots of work in this and we kind of just lost, you know, just took up too much time. But one of the things that, you know, we, we might do in the next neighborhood plan is kind of do something based on building sites and mobile phone masts and kind of say, you need to think about buildings and the impact on, on mobile telephony and you know, internet access and all the rest of it, because TV reception is an important principle um, in local plans. So any planning application that comes forward nowadays um, has to demonstrate it won't block radio signals from a TV antenna. Whereas today, for most people, I think, you know, that is more important than their um, antenna for their uh, television. Um, so that's something we, we could have done more work on in terms of um, locations of, of buildings. And, that, and part of the reason for doing that was also to deal with the sunlight daylight issue as well. So, so uh, Andrew, just want to come back um, on on sort of like moving from the specific questions, moving away from the specific questions. Safe. The general question: What are the timelines? Uh, look, just imagine someone decided tomorrow they mm -hmm. wanted to set up a neighbourhood uh, planning forum. What is the time scale are we looking at from that decision mm -hmm. to say a referendum on a neighbourhood plan? Um, so you have to go through a couple of big hoops. So the first of one, which is to set it up. And that's kind of, you know, from the Isle of Dogs, we did it pretty quickly. Uh, you know, I think we first meetings in August uh, and then we had our application in by the 1st of December. And also because in those days, there were only two application windows a year, which is completely illegal. But that's what Tower Hamlets Council was doing in 2014. Uh, they can't do that anymore because of these new government rules. And they have to do things within that, you know, within, I think, 13 weeks. So that whole kind of set up and sort of being recognized, you know, in theory could take you, you know, six months. Uh, the council will try and slow you down because they'll want to go to cabinet committees. But I said, you know, there are these rules now. So, so let's say that's six months, then writing the neighborhood plan, you know, will take time because you have to evidence this, you have to prove why you're doing it and you're writing legal, you know, and, 
you are writing legal policies, you know, that could, you know, that, you know, quite a few neighborhood plans have gone to courts of law and gone, you know, even a few have gone up to the high court. So you have to write policy, which is quite tight. And that's not an easy thing to do. So that, you know, if you're doing it quickly, that might take you a year. And you've then got these two six week public consultations and the public examination. And that might take you another four to six months. But as I said before, because in most cases, referendums are like, you know, it's going to happen is actually from the date of the examiner's letter is actually from that date. And even before that, you gather more and more weight as you go through the system. So when you've done your first public consultation, it starts to add a little bit more weight in the planning system. And then the date of the examiner's letter is like you're almost there because the governments have said, you know, in, in nearly every case, referendums are won. It's a yes vote. So why, why wait another three, four, five, six months for a referendum to confirm this? But it's a referendum that then completely nails it down in terms of so you know doing it really quickly is probably 24 to to 30 months the isle of dogs took a lot longer than that and that's because the council slowed us down which they can't do it anymore the gla um yeah they really messed us about quite badly but again that shouldn't be an issue for year you and then covid meant that obviously we then lost a year because a referendum wasn't allowed to happen because of, of COVID. And you know, so there, were, there was a big delay there as well. But in theory, these, these shouldn't happen for you. And, and because Spitalfields and Isle of Dogs have gone before you, council know more about this process. It's not new for them anymore. You, you, know, you can copy some of the things that we did. You, know, you can copy our constitution and maybe a few things you might want to change. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel anymore. There's more money from government than when we first started. So, you know, it is possible, but it's not something you can do in a couple of months either. And, and this is the other key issue is that this only works if if there's a small group of people willing to just push it through for that for those 24 months, 30 months or at least to because uh, once you've done your 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 consultation, there's not that much more work after that. In theory, it's the council who do most of the work after that point. So, um and that's why Lyme, um, sorry, why Spitalfields and Isle of Dogs happened is because you had that small group of people push, 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 push all the way through to, to make it happen. So, Cool. Um, and just a final one. Um, there's, a, there's this new movement called Yimbies mm -hmm. um, um, who are quite active in promoting development. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of them work in Westminster or linked to Westminster. We have a large growing segment in Tower Hamlets now. Um, some of them are quite active in the local Labour Party in quite prominent positions. Yeah. Um, how do you protect, how, how does a neighbourhood planning forum protect itself from an attack of the Yimbies, so to speak? Or do you, have you had any experience or? Um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that the Yimbies to call them, you know, and, and, and to be fair to them, you know, we do need to build more housing in, in London. You know, there's no issue about that. The issue is about how we do it, and where we do it, and how, whether we do it with the community and whether we bring the community along and, and show them the benefits of development. And because on the Isle of Dogs, we just don't see much benefit from this stuff, um, especially because most people can't afford these new apartments. Um, you know, that's why there is, there is opposition. Um, I think, I mean, Roman Road is an interesting one because some of the people behind that are kind of work in the architectural field. And, and what happened, actually, what, what happened with Wapping, so Wapping was one of the first ones to start, and it was actually started by some, somebody, I think he was an architect. And I wouldn't say he was a Yimby, but, but it was very, very kind of architect view of the world, which is a certain view. Um, and that basically fell apart because of uh, a lot of opposition locally. So that's the reason why Wapping never happened is because the community kind of didn't like what they were doing and, and made that very clear. And then, and, and then Limehouse had a big problem because there was personal disputes between people involved and people not involved. And then when they tried to reapply for an extension for five years, those disputes came to the front, so they didn't get recognised again. And, and one of the issues as well with Limehouse was the argument that people pushing the neighbourhood plan weren't reflective of the wider Limehouse community. And that's the reason why they got stopped. So if you did have a small group of people who were not representative trying to push one agenda, yes, there are various stages at which they could be stopped at the beginning and uh, uh, you know, various stages. Because you know, as I said, the whole point of neighbourhood plan, the reason why there's a referendum at the end of it 
is because you need local people to vote for this. So unless you're coming up with policies that you have co-written and co-developed with local people, or at least, you know, I'm not saying the Isle of Dogs neighbor plan is perfect and everybody loves it and, you know, and there aren't issues with it, but at least, you know, we did try our best to involve the local community and can, and, and can evidence that our public meetings and all the rest of it um, and all of the emails, you know, and the eight, 750 people on our email distribution list and number of people on Twitter and Facebook or people who came into our drop-in sessions, at least we were able to demonstrate that we did try to engage with the wider community. And, you know, and nobody, well, there was one guy in Sweden who objected to the Isle of Dogs Neighbourhood Plan, but the only opposition to the Isle of Dogs Neighbourhood Plan in terms of public it was was his former developer from the Isle of Dogs who now lives in Sweden and he was having a go at us on on Twitter, but that was it. That was the only person who was publicly against the Isle of Dogs neighborhood plans because we could prove that, you know, we, we at least tried our best to engage with people, even if we, yeah, um, weren't perfect at that. Cool. Um, we, we've nearly come to an hour since we've started. Has anyone got any final questions? Safe, anything else you got? Yeah, I've, I've always got questions here. <laughs> um, in terms of the um, uh, the planning impact and the CIL, mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of people, they see planning as quite an abstract thing, quite complicated, quite complex. Uh, could you just uh, tell us a little bit about the, um, the, the processes in which they can have tangible impacts? Um, because I get a feeling that that, that is also tied in with how people feel disempowered through the planning process as well. What's your view on that? So, I mean, this is the big problem locally. I mean, the Isle of Dogs has generated, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds for the council in terms of Section 106, which is the predecessor to, 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 community, to SIL, the Community Infrastructure Levy, and New Homes Bonus as well. But we just, we just don't see the benefit of, of that. I mean, there is a new primary school that's being built I mean, there's some internal GP surgery changes, but yeah, I mean, you, I, it'd be very hard for me to go around and to say, well, that happened because of that building paid that amount of money. And, and, the, and the reason why neighborhood planning exists and also then because community infrastructure levy is, is separate from neighborhood planning, but, and I, and I put in the chat that are linked to the spending the levy guidance and the community infrastructure levy is the government were encouraging people to do neighborhood plans and encouraging people to then put into their neighborhood plans how they wanted this money to be spent, precisely because they knew that if people saw the financial benefits from this development, um, they might be less anti-development. They might see some of the reasons, you know, because in the other dogs, you know, if they'd spent all of that SIL money, people might, um, you know, still, still I think would have issues with the height of these towers, but at least they'd say, well, at least they, it gave us that youth center or it gave us this new school or it gave us that new playground. Whereas we can't say that today. And that was what government were trying to do, was trying to say, well, if you have a neighbourhood plan and the 25% are still, you get some benefits from, from this development. The problem has always been the delivery side is, is actually getting the local authorities to, to actually do this stuff. And one of the problems has been is government to encourage this stuff, but don't mandate it. They don't force the council so, for example, like in the neighbor plan, it just simply says, you know, you should take you know, account of what's in the neighbor plan. It doesn't say spend the sill exactly based on what's in the neighborhood plan, unless you've got very good reasons to ignore it. Um, so the government kind of didn't do the final bit, which is to kind of force the local authority to do this. But they, they put lots of stuff in to encourage you to do neighborhood plans and to to respond to these sill consultations because yes, potentially it's, it is a lot of money uh, that's sitting in the bank account. And, and also the other thing I was saying earlier about sill, which is in that um, government thing is about how the 25% of sill can be spent, not just in infrastructure, but on things that support the development of an area. And, and if the example they quote is a community hall, because I mean, most neighborhood plans are in villages in Yorkshire. So for them having a new community hall is, is a big issue. Um, perhaps less of an issue on, in, in Tower Hamlets, but that's the example they quote, or affordable housing. Um, and because otherwise the problem will be as a council just, well, the problem we have right now with SIL is the council aren't spending the money. It's not even where, where they're spending it, it's actually they're not spending it um, because uh, most of it's just sat in the bank account right now. Cool. Um, 
sorry, I got distracted by a wasp uh, that's coming to my room. Um, but um, so is there any final questions before we bring proceedings to an end? No. So I just want to say um, this video is going to be put up on YouTube with all the links uh, provided um, and I'll will be pushed out on social media. But if anybody does have any further questions, I'm sure Andrew would be happy to answer them. Also, Andrew's kindly provided links to the Isle of Dogs uh, planning forum and the Spitalfields planning forum um, as a means of, um, sorry, there's a wasp that's <laughs> coming. Um, so, um, so, that'll be with the YouTube video, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who's participated and we'll uh, bring it to an end. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And okay. I'll deal with the and if you've got any questions, just get in contact. So <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Bye.